Welcome to the Geotape seminar. And today we have Lynn Ziedrich, who's going to talk about cooperativity of looping and supercoiling mediated base pair disruption to control DNA activity. Lynn, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here today, and it's so good to see some old friends that I haven't been able to see in so many years because of this pandemic. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys about some some new information that DNA is still continuing to reveal. We are shocked by these new findings, and we continue to be surprised by the things that DNA tells us. Um, and I hope that, that you will find it interesting and provocative as well. So I like to start with this slide because sometimes we forget, and I have a really nice model of DNA right here. And it's very easy for people doing, for example, physics, where you're going to pull DNA, or you know, any kind of experiments biochemically where you're going to look at DNA. It's easy to do little pieces of linear DNA because you can synthesize them, you can get high amounts of them. And certainly all the atomic structures we have of DNA are of DNA that's short and linear. So that means a lot of experiments are done with DNA that really has not much or no DNA activity. So this axis here is just really any of your favorite DNA activities. One of my favorite is transcription, but we like replication, um, site-specific recombination, repair. There are lots and lots of things that completely depend on DNA being slightly underwound relative to the state where most of the, the experiments are done. And I'm guilty of doing a lot of experiments with linear DNA too. So along this x-axis down here is just the degree of supercoiling. So if we have completely relaxed DNA, it would be equivalent-ish to a linear DNA. But when you unwind this helix relative to itself, you can see that the way that the this very elastic medium, anyway, will relieve that torsional stress is to writhe. So the writhing is increasing across the bottom of this axis. And so what we found is in vivo, so we did this in bacteria, in E. coli, um, for the first time, is that there's a certain degree of underwinding required for your favorite DNA reaction to happen. And there's a very switch-like behavior in vivo inside of a living cell where there's really no activity and suddenly there is activity. And so we first did that, as I said, in bacteria, but it's been done in yeast, and it's even now been done in human cells, living human cells. And what's really um, interesting is that we keep, it seems that all the cells have evolved to keep their DNA at a certain supercoiling homeostasis. So the linking number normalized for the length of the chromosome we're talking about is held at that same amount. And we think that that's evolved so that it can be shut off or turned on very easily by torquing the, the supercoiling. And um, what's also kind of interesting, and one of the reasons I'm in a microbiology department, is that rapidly growing viral infections, very <laughs> timely, and bacterial infections, and certainly cells that are uh, DNA in cancer cells, this DNA has now become more underwound, and it's impossible to shut it down. So what cancer and infection usually are is uncontrolled, very rapid growth. Because if we could keep that dampened, then it wouldn't be much as much a problem as it is now. So I always have wondered, if we could understand this switch, could we start to control these infections or cancer? So that's the motivation. And just to go a little deeper, just this is the only slide that's more kind of biology, but um, you may have heard of fluoroquinolone. Ciprofloxacin is one. Um, levofloxacin is used widely. And these target two of the type 2 topoisomerases. These are the enzymes that control this linking you know, number, that supercoiling that we're talking about. And many classes of anti-cancer drugs, and in fact all anti-cancer drugs used for children, target the human topoisomerases. And here is how they act. So I've depicted DNA just straight as relaxed DNA. So of course, that's not what it looks like when it's active, but that's how it's depicted here. Here is a topoisomerase, the C-shaped enzyme. And what happens is it normally, because it's a highly genotoxic event, the topoisomerase will break the DNA, pass a strand through, and ligate it. But it doesn't break it until it's ready to go, and it, the cell has evolved lots of mechanisms to control those breaks. 
And what happens is the drugs come in and stabilize that toxic intermediate. So that's called a cellular poison, termed by Nick Cosarelli. And when replication or transcription tracks through the DNA, that ends up in killing that cell. So that's how these drugs work. So I'm going to just say this because we have to understand the DNA. Everybody is worried about the protein. And so drug companies are you know, drugging the protein, the protein. And I'm like, hey, this is just as much DNA as it is protein. So this is part of the motivation that, that has motivated us, part of the motivation that we've used over these last decades. So not only is DNA homeostatically kept at that certain critical level so that you can turn it off or turn it on, perhaps, but transiently, there are extremes of supercoiling. So Laura Baranello, um, she's in Sweden now, but she was then with David Levins at the NIH, drew this really nice di diagram. I think physicists, we, we love wave theories and things, so this is where the RNA polymerase for transcription, for example, might be. And you see there's a wave function where there's extreme overwhelmed DNA in front of the polymerase, and that may decay over distance. And that distance can be as great as 10 kilobase pairs, so it's a very long-reaching effect. Similarly, for transcription, behind it, there's extremely underwound DNA, and that may decay with, with distance as great as 10 kb. With replication, it's different, because don't forget, you made two DNAs out of one, right? So we're not going to deal with the behind the replication fork issue, but in front of it, it looks really a lot like the polymerase. You transiently get extremely overwound DNA. So think of these polymerases zipping through all the time, transient overwound, transient underwound. And the drugs that target the top isomerases that I'm very interested in only target it in front. So there's something different, it seems, about positively or overwound DNA from negative supercoiled DNA, but all of it is really important. So we understand very little about positively supercoiled DNA, and we know even less about how it affects the, the top isomerases or the drugs that target them. And so we just backed up and asked the very basic question, how does supercoiling change the structure of DNA? Really, I'm trying to get at the nature of that switch, that on-off switch. And do negative and positively supercoiled DNA look similar? And there are two different sides of the fence that people fall on, and probably people on this, this, this call are going to feel that way. Either that it's the same, it's just the opposite chirality, or of course it's different because the, the chirality of the DNA in the helix is already chiral. So if you're going to turn it one way versus the other, of course it's not going to be the same. So people fall on either side of that, but we just wanted to know. So we did this, and some of you were at the meeting in Trieste, was it Trieste, I think, when I first talked about these results? Maybe it was Venice. Um, and we were just so excited because these, these simulations cranked for two years. We opened them, and we really were shocked because, of course, we didn't expect to see any of these things. And so sigma, most of you probably know, it's just a length-dependent or length-independent measure of the degree of supercoiling, how underwound or overwound it is. Here's underwinding in this direction, increasing. Here's overwinding, increasing in this direction. And so luckily, we included relaxed DNA as a control. And if you simulate relaxed DNA all day for two years, nothing happens. It wiggles around, but it doesn't do anything like base flipping and denaturation, for example. Um, and it certainly doesn't get elastic and shorter as it, as it starts to get more coiled. So, what we saw is even with the smallest amount of little bit of negative supercoiling, we saw these very site-specific base pair flipping. So one of the two bases that are stacked in the double helix, holding that double helix together, would flip. And so now you've got this very hydrophobic base hanging out in the solvent outside the DNA. What? And we saw it for every single, each of these are independent simulations. And then we saw these denaturation bubbles. But if you looked at the movie of these, you saw that it started with a base flipping event. Then the neighbor, I'm sorry, then the partner, so choop, choop, then the neighbor, 
And what happens is you then nucleated this entire denaturation bubble, which allowed the rest of the DNA molecule to relax to B form and look just like the relaxed DNA. So DNA, when it's negative supercoiled, at least without proteins and nucleosomes and all those caveats there, right, not bound to membranes, just totally DNA alone, is distinctly biphasic. It is either no longer the B form DNA helix or it's perfectly relaxed B form. And we think that this B form is the energetic drive because there's a, <laughs> DNA loves to be in this perfect relaxed state to allow this crazy denaturation bubbles, independent of proteins. There are no proteins in any of our simulations, of course. But I want to point out that all of these denaturation bubbles started out as a base flipping event. So the bases are splayed on the outside of the DNA. So in the positive direction, this behaved like our perfect elastic medium. So that was good because 60 years of really great research is true in the positive supercoil regime. So it becomes more and more, you can see how it gets tighter and tighter, the helix does, right, with increasing supercoiling, to a point where we were shocked. And again, a very sharp phase transition. There was absolutely no hint of polyimide DNA for this degree of supercoiling. And then at this degree, it popped immediately. Polling like DNA, so it's not really polling. There are no three strands in here. There are just two strands. But it's completely turned inside out with the bases splayed outwardly. And that's a great way to relieve the torsional strain. And what do you see? It's the same case as we saw in the, the negative supercoiled DNA, that the rest of the DNA relaxed back to B form. Again, I think that's the energetic sink that allows this crazy form to just hang there. And it once it formed, was very stable over the duration of a very short simulation. But Graham let this run another couple of years, and those were very stable. So that's just for simulations. And any of you who do simulations know you always get those reviewers and those people who say, that's just simulations, or that's just math. Who cares? And of course, we all care a lot. And we're like, no, 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 we believe it because we fit the parameters very carefully. But People won't believe you. So we had to set out, and of course this is 2009, so I can tell you it took until yesterday when the paper was published to show that these things might actually be true. So in silico, what we found is that negative supercoiling causes sequence-specific base flipping. Sufficient negative supercoiling, this site-specific base flipping leads to denaturation via, via a series of flip bases. The positive supercoiling winds DNA tighter, just like a spring or my telephone cord, and that's an elastic rod, to the point where the regions begin to flip inside out to form polling-like DNA. There is a distinct biphasic structure of DNA when it's supercoiled on either side. We've got the relaxed B form and the crazy stuff. And all of these things are protein independent. So in the field, in the biology field, there were always proteins assigned to do these things. Oh, they must come in and pull that base out. And the question always was, where does the energy come from? Because none of those proteins used high energy cofactors. So it was always a mystery. And so at least we were able to plug in a potential answer for that mystery. It's the torsional stress of supercoiling that may provide the energy. But of course, the real question, does this happen in real DNA? I got my flu shot yesterday, and I've got this little bit of a, so you're going to have to tolerate me getting some water. So um, here's what we did, and this took us quite a while to figure out. And everyone always asks, so I'm going to show how we did it. So we take plasma DNA, and this is easy to isolate. Everyone can get plasma DNA. You can buy it now from virtually every chemical vendor. Um, so we had to engineer some sites in here. And what we did is if we put these recombination sites, this is going to be at for attachment, for bacteria, attachment for phage, for lambda integrase, then what we could do, depending very strongly on supercoiling, like everything in biology, and don't forget that this is double helical DNA. I've depicted it here as a ribbon. I think all of you are used to this, but 
it still confuses some people. So these are all double-stranded DNA, and the whole thing is now supercoiled, much like by model, okay? So we, we figured out that we could control this ant so that it would recombine and make this tiny red loop linked to the rest of the mess. Because when DNA is so large, so there's so many beautiful TAD studies and high seeks and all of these beautiful seek studies going on right now, and that's looking at the entire, all the DNA in a cell, right? And it's so amazing. But we were trying to ask things on a, a much smaller and more detailed atomic scale. So what we needed was to go smaller. We needed tiny, tiny circles of DNA that we could control it precisely, the supercoiling of. So we use topoisomerase 4 to decatenate those, and it's very easy just by size exclusion to get rid of this big mess and get very, very pure, supercoiled, tiny circles, as small as a couple hundred base pairs. So it's not as tiny as some people make, but I can make grams of them versus, you know, micrograms. So to show you how pure they are, and this is published, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's, it's kind of, you know, even for me, it's interesting to go back and look at how pure these things can be. So here is the completely relaxed DNA. And on this particular gel, it runs, this is a direction of electrophoresis, it runs just like a nicked DNA. So see how they run very similarly. So that has exactly 32 turns of the helix. So the linking number is 32 exactly. And if we take one supercoil out, so it's a negative one, that's an LK of 31 or a delta LK minus one. We can keep going all the way out to delta LK of minus six or an LK of 26. In the positive direction, we can put a supercoil in and already you can see these are, there's no phasing issues here because this is exactly 32 turns. So the 33 does not run with the 31. And when I spoke in Venice, this is the part we were most excited about. Um, so here, the two also doesn't run with the minus two and the three doesn't run with the three. So the positive supercoiling DNA is running very differently. But I show you this just to show you how pure, and we can overexpose this, we can use radioactivity to enhance any possible bands there's no contamination, so that when we cut this band out and we look at it, we can be very sure to a 0.001% purity that we're only looking at a unique linking number. And that's very important because we were making some pretty, pretty grand conclusions about looking at the three-dimensional structures of these. So let me just back up a second and say, all of you know that supercoiled DNA loops are ubiquitous through biology. And these are very important for chromosome regulation, packaging, gene regulation, nucleosome positioning. And interestingly, and I think, again, this is something that Nick Cazzarelli first pointed out, is that, they, that these loops allow individual topological states. So you insulate. So let's say you're going to replicate this loop or transcribe a gene on this loop. You're completely independent of the topology, the supercoiling of that one. Right? So it's a very powerful idea that that may be one of the reasons we've evolved, all life forms have evolved these loops, because topology really, really matters. All right, I already showed you this band, these gels. So here's what we did. We cut these out, and we looked at them in three dimensions using cryo-ET. And I'm not going to go into that. I usually do, but that's published. It's a long time ago now, and many of you have heard me talk about this. But today, I'm just going to say, we looked at the distribution. So this was a new thing to do with individual particles. We actually analyzed the, the statistics of individual particles. We were not averaging lots of particles together. So this is individual particle um, statistics here. And really, the point of this is everything in yellow was something unexpected. Um, and it was unexpected because of these really sharp bends. And you can see some of them here, where the DNA almost looks like it's collapsed on itself. But we know it's not nicked. We know it's not linear. We know it's not a contaminant because it's exactly the right size and length. And remember, these things are very, very pure. There are no relaxed contaminants. There's no linear contaminants anywhere. And so this is reminiscent. Some of you might remember Jacques Dubachet had this collapsed DNA. He says, where does the supercoiled DNA go? Why is it that the, the density of two helices on top of each other really kind of looks like one helix? It's sort of the same. 
So it's a very different, maybe, structure than what we think. You know, we try to put this nice smooth bending on the ends, but, you know, smooth bendings, you've always got this little loop at the bottom. Hope you can see this. Okay, I put it really close to my camera, right? And, and we're not seeing that. We're seeing something else, and we're seeing it the vast majority of the time. So positive and negative supercoiled DNA contains really sharp ends far beyond the prediction in the known models of DNA. So our hypothesis, and we published that in the 2015 paper, was that our site-specific base slipping that we had observed via our molecular dynamics simulation, atomistic explicit solvent molecular dynamics simulation, that maybe the base flipping makes a pivot point. So if you have a base flipping, that would be a point where the DNA could fold in on itself, and that would be a very different type of DNA than the smooth bend that everybody is trying to model in supercoiled DNA at the ends. Um, or maybe in the overwound direction, maybe the pDNA could also cause, and you could see that in our simulations, that the pDNA was very, very sharp. So how do we get at that? Of course, we can't. We've tried. We can't seem to crystallize these things, um, perhaps because, as you saw in this picture, each individual topoisomer adopts a distribution of shapes, and these may be going back and forth. Our simulations would indicate that they are. We don't know. Some may be a little more metastable. So it's a little bit reminiscent of the Dill and Chan model for the protein folding problem, you know, the funnel, where there's multiple metastable states. Some may hang for a while and get stuck, but some may actually go to their most stable state. And of course, for DNA, the most stable state is always going to be that relaxed B form. So we could just ask the question, and this is what we started with with this paper that came out yesterday, um, are DNA bases exposed, right? Because that sort of gets at this question. So we used two different nucleases, and these are, these are general nucleases. They just cleave up DNA. Um, and we just said, hey, if there are bases exposed, these nucleases should clip the DNA. So what we're measuring here is the rate at which these nucleases, here this one is BAL31. It's from an ocean bacterium, which is very interesting when you think about what is it doing. Um, I don't think we'll get back to that, but maybe you'll want to ask me at the end. It's interesting. Um, so what we did is you, you've seen this axis before, right? So relaxed DNA, of course, never does anything. BAL31, if it's got ends, it'll gradually chew it up very, very slowly, a, a very slow rate. But under these conditions, nothing happens. Um, and we just said, how underwound must you be to see the nuclease digest it? And you can see it was a very sharp transition. There was no nuclease activity here. There was a little bit here, and it just increased steadily. All right? And we used not only the 336, which is exactly 32 turns of the helix, but we have all the, LK, all the base pair sizes, the lengths around that, so that we can really precisely get the sigma value exactly and try to pick out, okay, where does this happen? Um, and so there was definitely a threshold value. And in the positive direction, and you see that these rates are about 100 times slower, uh, you saw the same thing. Nothing, nothing, that's the elastic form of DNA. It hasn't flipped into perhaps a pDNA. We don't have proof of pDNA, but we don't know what else it would be to make exposed bases. And there's a little bit here and more and more with increasing positive supercoiling. And just to remind you what pDNA would look like, that's how those bases might be exposed. If you have another model or another idea, I would love to hear it, but that's the only one we can come up with. And so S1 nuclease will only clip when the denaturation bubbles, which we had observed in our 2009 paper, are, are bigger than four base, bases that are disrupted. So it doesn't tell you that the bases are on the outside, but it does tell you that bases are exposed. So with BAL31, even a single base flipping will be cleaved. With S1 nucleases, it has to be nuclease, it has to be four bases completely unpaired before it will cleave. So let's have a look. So what we see is that threshold for the BAL31, the single base flipping event, is much lower than the threshold required for the four bases of, of denaturation. So 
These two things, so we had to figure all this out. We had to do all this enzyme kinetics on these two nucleases that have been used for tools, but really we didn't understand the molecular mechanism. So half of the supplementary data in our paper are really determining how these things act. What do they do? When do they act? But now we have a very powerful way to map, because where does that cleave, and distinguish between a single base event and four or more base event. Okay, so that was the setting for what we were trying to figure out. So we already knew that loop length really mattered. So what did, why, why do people go smaller and smaller? Why do they model smaller and smaller? For one thing, we can do atomistic modeling with smaller and smaller, but it's also because the increased curvature kind of dramatizes things. Well, let's think about biology. So I keep, I keep up. We've got um, uh, Lieberman, Aiden Lieberman uh, eras in, in our, in, at Baylor College of Medicine, and I'll call him about every six months. I'm like, all right, what are the smallest loops you guys found? And they're down into the hundreds now. So they're actually mapping hundreds of base pairs of loops in, in actual li living cells, well, previously living before they did all the stuff to them to do the, the matching. So I think this is very powerful and cool. And this is geometry, and this is, of course, what we love. Um, so loop length really exacerbates the nuclease digestion. So let's have a look at the data. We had already looked at the 336. We just looked at twice bigger, and this is exactly the same sequence that was important to us, because when you start changing sequence, you might change who knows what, right? So this is exactly two of these in tandem. So same sequence, just two of them. And look how much more supercoiling it takes before that threshold of base exposure happens. It still happens, and it still happens around the threshold of that, that switch I showed you on the very first slide. Um, but you see it's much, much more. And that's because of the, in, we think, I mean, if you come up with another idea, then that would be a great thing to, for me to think about. But in this paper that we published yesterday, we at least think that it's about the degree of curvature. So the degree of curvature, the geometry, will increase the activity of these nucleases. And these nucleases are just probes. They're very important in their own right for what they do, um, but we're just using them in this case for probes. So therefore, the increased curvature increases the supercoiling dependent base pair disruption. So let's start mapping it, because I told you already, BAL31 is a nonspecific nuclease, and yet when people use it as a probe, it seems to be probing, but we don't know. They didn't know. They just knew that it was clipping at DNA that had either mismatches or, you know, some kind of helical disruption. So um, Craig Benham has this wonderful web SIB predictor. Maybe some of you guys have used it. We certainly use it all the time. And you can download it and use it anytime you want. And what's really interesting to us, and this was in the, the, the oh, I got the wrong, it was in our previous 2015 paper, I think we mentioned this. We had mapped that the BAL31 was clipping exactly opposite of where this was supposed to be the destabilized site. So, from the sequence alone and torsional stress alone, not looping, this is where the looping really becomes important, and that's what is brand new in this paper, is that how does looping affect all of this stuff. And so what's going on? Well, Stasiak and his collaborators had proposed this, this um, cooperative linking model where, okay, if this destabilizes, that may force it to be found at the apex of a superhelix. So let's say that this is the WebSID site. And so now what's happened is you've got this other site forced to be on the other side, right? So that's this cooperative model. And maybe that's what we were seeing. And so we asked, what about all the other supercoiling levels? Well, it ends up that sure enough, the, the Venom site, the WebSID site, predicted site, we're going to call it site two because this is the one we found first. This is totally what biologists do, don't they? they oh, site one is first, site two is second. So otherwise it makes it just completely arbitrary. So let's look at the degree of negative supercoiling for BAL31. And remember, it can clip when there's a single base exposed. So 
We had done in the paper, we had looked at, I think, this minus three. So you see this site one. And that's the only one we could see in the previously published paper. But here we did a much, much more careful and a much more thorough analysis. And sure enough, even in that site, there were some cleavage at the Benham site and some cleavage at this other site that we had not seen before. And these changed when we looked at the very, the most relaxed one, so the LK of 31 and a delta LK minus one. Site one is mostly used, but then there's a whole lot of site three. And there's more site three used in the minus two. What? So these are the two that are on the apices, but there's this third site that's popping out, okay, and being clipped by BAL31. So we can map them. And it's not random. It's very specific at these sequences. And remember in our simulations that the base flipping that we saw was very sequence dependent. It didn't just pop anywhere. Very specific bases would flip. And as you increase negative supercoiling, the site two, the Craig Benham site, becomes the dominant. Well, almost dominant. Site one is still pretty dominant. So this might be the most supercoiled one, might be this long supercoiled writhe structure, as shown here. So there's one and two. Okay, well, what about S1 nuclease? Because remember, that one clips only when the bubble is big enough to be four, okay? Well, it looks kind of similar, but there's a whole lot more of this site three. So what that tells us is that site three, once it goes, it seems to go and be a denaturation bubble. So whatever that sequence is might be a sequence that is recognized by something somewhere, right? Because this is getting back to this question. It's like, what is happening and why is this a denaturation point? And you can think about things like transcription initiation or replication initiation. People talk about and textbooks say that proteins come in and do this. And we're going to say, hey, supercoiling is allowing DNA to do this on its own. And now the proteins can come in and bind by recognizing a denatured region in the DNA. So if we looked at the double length DNA, the one I, I had previously shown you, that it takes more supercoiling to cause the, the bases to be exposed, but they still become exposed. So when we mapped that, we only got the site, site two. And that's because, remember, these are two of these together. So now the site opposite of this site is itself. And sure enough, in the cryo-ET data, if we looked at that, we can see that they're all these really nice, rigid, supercoiled rise rods. You know, they all looked like that. They didn't have the crazy, crazy shapes. So this tells us that beyond a certain curvature, so as the geometry becomes more relaxed and the circle is larger, it's going to behave more like what we had predicted with models previously. It's when the DNA loops become very small that the curvature effects start to dominate and really control what bases are exposed and what shape that molecule will take. So what's interesting, remember that very first figure I showed you, is that the degree where these things start happening corresponds to when recombination happens, decatenation happens, all of the other DNA activity happens. And so we think that the base exposure might be the first event for all of those DNA activities. In other words, the DNA is calling these proteins to come act at these sites rather than the proteins searching and searching and trying to say, oh, here's my CAGT. That's where I'm going to bind, right? Because the, the DNA itself is already ready and primed. So this is a kind of a complex model, but it does capture everything that we talked about today. So we already knew that within this circle, we had this site too. This is the one that WebSID would pick out. We know that it has an intrinsic bend. Um, and that's probably important biologically. This is part of that recombination site. So when you start putting actual biological function encoded on these DNAs, we're going to see a lot more interesting stuff, I'm sure. But right now, the only thing interesting on this circle is that biologically relevant sequence. So it is prone to bend. So here we just show it in the, you know, the way we normally draw it. But it either is straight and bends to become that, or it's straight and it starts to bend and has a base flip, and then the base flip allows it to bend, 
We don't know what comes first. Maybe it's an equilibrium as we've depicted here. So whatever is, if it's got a base slip or if it is just bent, there it is. And that serves as a nucleation point for the apex of the supercoiled DNA, forcing another site down here to now have to be where it is. And that's the Stasiak model. And now that's the same thing. Is that bending and then base slipping? Or did it base slip immediately? Because remember, we are detecting bases exposed on either end of this. So that one's an easy one to explain. But that doesn't explain this crazy site three, does it? So here's the other one. Maybe site two is just hanging out like that. It's got this slight bend, but it's not base flipped. Because remember, site one was what we got in several of the topoisomers, the individual degree of supercoiling. And here's the base slip happening. And then that allows it to, to really bend sharply. And when that happens, this loop is now very large, and that it facilitates more writhe. So this one becomes more writhed compared to this one. Remember, we saw those distributions of shapes by our cryo-ET data, cryo-electron tomography data. I, don't, I shouldn't use acronyms. So if this is true, then now you've made this loop very small. So it's going to be kind of constrained, and it may base flip. And we have measured the base slipping. And so what that is is you've got this correlation of one site causing base slipping at a different site. So we've, we can measure that there's base slipping on both of these. And by S1 digestion, we see that those can become as large as four bases of denaturation bubbles. As we try to depict, this is actually the right length uh, here. So there's a little bit of denaturation, a little bit of denaturation. And you see what that allows. It, it becomes very compressed and very, a very plectinemic um, supercoil. So site three, here's the enigma, right? Because we thought, well, okay, this all makes sense. And here's the one that we didn't predict. Some sequences, and this was not in a known biologically relevant sequence. Um, we don't know what the sequence would normally do, but we think in real DNA there's going to be lots of these types of sequences. That nucleation event, which is always a base pair flip, a base flip, um, happens, and it may help position. You see how it, it positions it so that it can facilitate more writhe. All of this is how do you t deal with torsional stress? What is the best way that the DNA can deal with torsional stress that is the least genotoxic? Because evolutionarily, the DNA would never have survived were it to be denatured in large bubbles, because large bubbles are very, very um, mutagenic. They're going to mutate into something else, which does happen, obviously. And it's also very unstable. Genome makes genomes very unstable. So writhing is really a great way to preserve your genome. So, and just that little event will preserve it. But finally, if you have enough supercoiling, this thing, the base pair, the first base flip, will turn into a denaturation bubble. And that itself is enough to completely relax the rest of the molecule. That may have a little bend in it. We did consistently see little kinks in the tops of the, the, the open circles that we saw with very strong negative supercoiling. So this is really about twist and writhe, isn't it? It's all about twist and writhe. Do it. I know you're going to love that. So writhe is really good for being you know, stable and making the genome transmit generation to generation, but you sometimes deal with this is basically a twist. So all of the LK is now in twist. There is no writhe whatsoever. Phew. So that was a hairy little thing, but I hope you followed it. And just for fun, we kept seeing this crazy, crazy difference. I told you that we had all these different length DNA. And of course, we love the 336 because there's no phasing issue. This 336, if you nick part of the DNA, it's going to be perfectly aligned and just be straight. So, you know, kind of like this. Here's the nick 336. And sure enough, if you use these nucleases, it doesn't recognize anything. So this nick DNA, 300 minutes with the nucleases, nothing happens. And that's because even though it's got a nick, that nick is not exposed, OK? So the, the, it doesn't know that there's a base exposed. But when you're either side, um, either 333, so your, your phasing is now a little different, um, of the perfect LK of 32, OK? When you're either side of it, 
you see that the nuclease is confined, that there's a nick there. So here's another thing that loops do, because you would never see this in a linear DNA. The linear DNA will always be straight. In fact, people have crystallized it. Alex Rich was like, well, it can be nicked, but how in the world does ligase know where to act? Looping may provide that answer, because the looping now shows this phasing difference, and now the nuclease or the repair enzymes, if we were in the live cell, could come in and recognize, oh, there's a problem here. I better ligate it. Okay, so here are the rates. Here's everything we did. But what's really fun about this is I love measuring directly the linking number, right, under the conditions that I'm actually working in. And so we were able to, with this, you can actually go in and determine exactly the linking number for these circles under these conditions. And the way you do that is if they're all the same as they are, right, so here's the three. And what you do is here's the 336. One and two over, they look about the same. So really these are very close to each other. But you see the phasing here starting to happen in the 339, because it's got an extra few base pairs. It doesn't line up perfectly with the NIC. And here's the 333, and it goes in the other direction. So from that, we were actually able to measure directly that the helical repeat was 10.48 for this particular DNA sequence under these conditions. All right. So I'm going to let you guys read this while I take more water, because my voice is weird. All right, is everybody with me? Everybody read them all? I don't need to read to you. So another thing I didn't say yet was when you have these base looping events mediated by the loop, you now lower the cost that it takes to form these small loops. And that's been a very interesting point of discussion that people have had over the last several years. How in the world can you get DNA, which is pretty rigid, to make smaller and smaller loops? And it ends up from Graham's, Graham Randall's from our 2009 paper, you know, these site-specific base slipping events, they occur fairly often. We didn't know, so we didn't know to put them in there, but they randomly occurred six times in our circle that we had, in our sequence that we had first simulated. And that, of course, is not a comprehensive look at all possible sequences. So it's going to be very interesting to see the effect of more biologically relevant DNA and other DNAs, because so far we have really only looked at one. And one really smart reviewer asked us, well, you need to do this with completely different sequences. And I'm like, it took us five years to do it with this one sequence. And which sequence do we look at, right? So this is work that takes forever, and I wish we could do every single sequence, but this is where we hope that some of our simulations might help inform which sequences to start changing out. But we think that there are going to be naturally enough of these base flipping sequences that small loops can probably be formed in most DNA. So back to geometry, physics, math. So loops provide a way for cells to regulate DNA activity. Loops and supercoiling together make what's been called by Decker. He's called it a secondary DNA code, and that's really cool, right? DNA sequence really matters, and it could be modeled, but we have to figure out the rules, and we're far from knowing the rules. And I didn't talk about it today, but even in our original simulations, we did have all the counter ions. And you can imagine that when there are base flipping and denaturation events happening, and certainly with the pDNA that happened in our simulations, the counter ion cloud around the negatively charged DNA is really disrupted. It's not just this even counter ion cloud. It's actually very spotty and 
and it's that's a whole nother degree that we need to dig into to understand how that may either help proteins to come to a certain area or avoid a certain area. So it's something that's really not talked a lot about, but I think is going to be very important. And so for this, um, this just shows kind of what we used to think. Uh, this is for positively supercoiled DNA, and it behaves so nice, the nice figure eight, like drawn in all the textbooks, right? But the equal and opposite, the negative supercoiling, we have that so-called collapsed DNA. The density looks about like it's a single helix, but we know that it's not. This is supercoiled. And we propose that this is either um, site one or site two, and there's a disrupted base. And what that did is it allowed this to all become closer to B form. It really magnifies the, the length of that loop because it loves to be B form and it wants to be straight. So that kind of shows us maybe that these sharp bands that we were seeing in the cryo electron tomographs might be uh, indeed disrupted bases. So we've identified, I, I want to have plenty of time for discussion. Um, I can, I, 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 this is just by simulation. You know, I'm trying, we're trying to do simulations to help inform which to do with the very hard stuff, which is the, with the real DNA. So we've identified these bending sequences, the one that can form maybe this kind of stuff, okay? And so can we, we figure if we don't really understand something if we can't, change it. So can we take that bending sequence and move it around and change the shape of DNA? And just I'll just throw that out there. That was published a few years ago, but in the context of our new work, I think it's pretty cool. And this is really coarse grain. Like, this is not our atomistic stuff, but it's pretty interesting. So here were the two bend sequences in a, you know, the typical figure eight DNA. And when we put in when we cloned in the sequence of the, of the simulation, this bending sequence, we could now make a new structure. So that was pretty cool because maybe we are getting closer to at least with this sequence that we're working with here, which is not, as I said, it's not even an interesting sequence because we haven't yet gotten to that point. Um, we may be able to control the DNA shape. And why does that matter? Well, I don't know if you've heard of the nanotechnology world or nanoparticles, but people long ago, you know, the whole nano blow up was, was really, no matter what the material might be, it can be gold or it can be, you know, quantum dot sugar balls, all kinds of things. Um, there is a, a, a maximal effect at around 50 nanometers. So this is this, you know, why nanoparticles are so interesting. And that just holds true really no matter what you're looking at. And there's lots of data. I'm not going to go into it. And so what people who are making nanoparticles, the problem is how do you make the same kind of shape over and over? And then how do you impregnate that with drugs or DNA? In fact, a lot of these people contact me and they want my mini circles to put onto their, you know, flying saucers or all these different shapes that they've been able to successfully make. And they're inert, so they don't do harm. But of course, they're inert and they don't do good either. And what's pretty fun, and there's like really cool stuff, like, you know, some are good for cancer, some are good for lung cells. So this could be really, really interesting and useful. Um, so what's amazing is our mini circles are. 50 nanometers, kind of funny, and they have very distinct shapes that maybe we can control. And so, and the, th the cool thing is they don't have to be tied to something, gold or carbon or, you know, any of these other inert materials. They are themselves the therapeutic. And so um, that's pretty fun to think about, <laughs> and that's some of my, my new grants to try to see if this can work. Because like I said, we figured out how to make grams of these things, and that actually gets us into potentially interesting ways to use these for therapeutics. And I have bonus slides if there's time and interest, but I really do want to get questions, and so I can stop here. Um, we can take a poll. Do we want me to show just a couple bonus slides, or do you want to uh, to go on to the questions? Why don't you take a few questions, and then if there's time, show us the bonus. So, folks, ask some questions. Uh, I've got okay. one that's, 
Go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I, I go ahead first. <laughs> I have very basic questions, uh, several, so I start with one. Um, um, so you, you mentioned these uh, high bending regions, so the curvature effects, etc. Uh, uh, are these highly bent region um, uh, strictly related to the base pair sequence. Uh, in other words, the base pair sequence, can you identify or can you correlate the high bending region with a specific sequence of base pairs? So it's both. Because um, remember the one, if, if you are making a, a figure eight type of or a rive molecule, you're forcing this sequence down here to now bend. So that one will become second to the first one. The one that is in the at P site that we knew about is been well worked out. It, it is a bent sequence, even under supercoiling. A lot of these HE tracks and things that people used to use to, to look at bent DNA and run it on gels, that was off with linear DNA, and when you supercoil those, that disappears. So this is actually a sequence that still maintains a degree of curvature with less, a little bit of less supercoiling, right? So we don't know all the rules yet and how far, you know, because the base flipping event with low negative supercoiling is just a single base and it goes in and out, in and out, in and out. It takes a little more before the, the partner will then go out and that's a little more stable than this one. So this one's wiggling, wiggling, at least by our simulations. We don't have this in real life, of course. Um, but this one's a little more stable. So how much does it depend on what's that next base pair step. So this base pair step is well known to be a very open one, a very much prone to denaturation, but that one's neighbor also matters. So now the denaturation bubble may, may move this way instead of that way. And we haven't, of course, comprehensively done all the sequences to yet know, but Wilma Olson's, her DNA, you know, when she looked at the PDB, she looked at all of those things. So far, everything that we've tested agrees perfectly with her base pair step conclusions. So the at least the nucleating event, which is a single base flipping, we think, um, is perfectly in line with her findings. But how the neighbors affect it, and of course how looping affects it, because that's never been looked at crystallographically. You know, even when we get extreme bent DNA in some of those crystals, it's always attributed to the protein that it's found bound to. Right? And of course, there's no torsional stress in it. This is why geometry really, really matters, and, and torsional stress, you know, the linking number really, really matters. So I guess that's a, mostly we don't know, but we know a little bit. Okay, thank you. I have a question about site three and link equal twist plus rive. You had a, this very interesting slide where you had a big site three denaturation and boom, the damn thing was then relaxed. Is that what happens and all the twist goes to the denaturated, denatured bit? Yes, and, and that it was a mystery in our 2015 papers, like why more supercoiled DNA looked open circular. And that's where this contamination question becomes so important. In fact, one of the reviewers very smartly and very accurately said, oh, that's a contaminant. And I'm like, but it's happening too much and we could overexpose it. We never see a contaminant of open circle, right? So it still runs topologically on the gel as that tight bend. And yet, you know, I can share my screen. Can I reshare my screen? Yes, I think so. Sure. Let's go back to, the, to that distribution. Um, by the cryo-ET. This thing. So here is open circle, and here's the minus two. So here's the minus one, and you see there's no open circle. And if there were gonna be a contaminant when you're cutting out the band, you would think that, well, I might accidentally have gotten some open circle when I cut out my minus one. But cutting out the minus two, why would there be open circle contaminants? So there's no open circle in the minus one and suddenly there's open circle. And there's just as much open circle in the minus two as other things. So, and those open circles look just like this. And you see how there's that little bend. They're always, they're, they're never round. You know, you would think with, with is, it, is it Young's modulus? You would think that the thing was really gonna be round, but this is where the sequence matters and that, that that bending site that, that wants to bend is right there and that I think forces it to be a little bit um, oblong. 
But we saw this, we, just, we, just, we saw a few of the open circles in the minus three, but look in the minus four, there's again a significant fraction of things that looked open circular. And we were so concerned with contamination, right? So this is why I've got a lot more slides to show, you know, the supplementary material shows that it really is not contamination. We can take these bands and treat them with type one or type two topoisomerases and watch them move one step at a time and there's just no zeros, you know? so. I think, DeWitt, that we do have, this is now manifest as twist. So four LK are purely twist and makes it look like it's relaxed and there's no writhe. Cool. I know, twist and writhe, it's all about it. And another question would be about the site-specific uh, characterization of these denaturation places. Are they the same for the negative as the positive supercoiling? Do you get the denaturation in the same place? Oh, you win. You're so tough. You're, you may as well be our tough reviewers. But you know, the paper always gets better because these tough reviewers, we couldn't map them. So remember I told you that rate of cleavage with either nuclease? Well, S1 nuclease doesn't touch positive supercoil DNA because it requires mm -hmm. four. There's never four. And if they're in pDNA form, that makes sense because they're all, you know, they're all wadded up. If you look at our, our simulations, they're all wadded up. They can't get at those bases, I think. So there's never an S1 cleavage, but with the BAL31, the rate is 100 to 1,000 fold slower. So what happens is by the time you get that first clip, which allows us to map it, it goes to the second clip. It goes nink, nink. And so it's just a smear and we can't get the site. So we've been unable to, to map the positive supercoils. We're thinking of other ways to try to do that, but that's a fabulous question. We, it better be different, but we don't know. I have several questions. Hi, Ben. Hello. Hi, Ben. So I do it. This is wonderful talk, Ben, just wonderful. Thank you. First, my observation of this question, when you break a stick, right, break it, it bends, then suddenly breaks up, right? So, that's kind of like what's coming out with you, but, right? One interesting thing is they found if you break a stick under some condition, it'll break into three pieces. So I wonder if in your twisting, you can get regular break for a long stretch um, and predict where they're going to be. I can add the circle. It looks like from your pictures, it might be the pitch that leads to either denaturation or the peak um, structure. Increase the pitch too much, denaturation. Make it too small, you have peak in it. When you make a circle, you decrease the pitch on the inside, increase it on the outside. So, I wonder if, um, with the small circles, you can get both increased P DNA and increased teenage duration on the outside. Okay. Okay, maybe you were a reviewer two. Um, so reviewer two talked a lot about pitch and talked about if it were on the outside versus the inside and even the direction. I wasn't the reviewer. Okay, but because it's a really good point. And they even brought up this, you know, for there's this field in medicine that I didn't know, in surgical um, medicine for, for bone breaks, that's the same thing as the stick. When a bone breaks, it never breaks there's like, like a, a weak point, and when you look in the microstructure, there's always a second break. And so the question was, you know, could that be happening with DNA? And of course, these, these overall principles could be happening, but we, 
We looked and looked. We could not find the data. I start, I didn't know how, I'm like, what do they call it in bones? You know, I said, because I am in a medical school, I can get every single, you know, right. surgery journal and I can't find the data. So if you have the data on the sticks, is, is, are there data? We didn't end up discussing it because we couldn't find anything to talk about that I could refer to. You know, I could just say generally, okay, sticks break twice and bones break twice too or three times but I couldn't find the data. So we really did spend a couple of months trying and asking everybody we knew in the fields to help us and nobody could find references, so. I never saw a theory, I just saw an experimental paper once that did that. Well, um, if you find that paper, find send that paper it on to us. On to us. Yeah. But it's a really important point and I didn't talk about that at all. In one or two of the supplementary figures and there's a you know, these papers nowadays, and I hate that I'm one of these people, but we have 15 supplementary figures, but they do bolster the conclusions that we've made, you know, in the primary paper. But one of the things does deal with that phasing and angle issue a little bit, at least we talked about it, and we just say, look, it, it's definitely important. Like, one more twist and you're gonna take it from the inside to the outside, and suddenly right. that's a different right. curvature, right? Yeah. So. And, right. and, and, and that all gets back to where really we're trying to explain these weird shapes that we saw and the fact that there are distribution of shapes for a given very precise linking number. So we're just all trying to get back to that. And I think that that, you know, physicists call it a, a, a metastable or I guess a frustrated state. So it could be that you're, you're wanting to be this way, but gee, it's an equal isogenic way to be that way as well. So you may flip from one to the other and there may be rapid interchange among two of those and less so amongst the third one. But of course we don't know yet. Very nice work. Thank you. Hi, I have a question, I, I, Lee. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Enzo. Oh, Christian, sorry. Go ahead, Christian. Is it okay? So I, I had a question about the tandem mini circles. Uh, I, I very much like the talk, very, very didactical, very inspiring. So if I, uh, I think I understood that the tandem mini circles just expose at the apices of these site two, uh, sites two, no, at, at both ends. And then I, I'm not sure if I got it right. What happens to site three? It, does it play any role or because I would say same thing as before, but maybe if I didn't get it wrong, maybe it was not showing up anymore. So can you elaborate? It doesn't, you're, you're totally right, Christian. So it doesn't show up in the, in the doubly length. And we think that's about the curvature. And we think this is again, why we can kind of more confidently, there, there are many small bits, bits of evidence that we can stack on top of each other to say that the looping and the increased curvature really matters. And that's just one of them because we looked very hard and there's no site three, but we can't goose up the supercoiling. You know, we can only get it to a certain state. We can't get it enough to have that site three exposed without that extra curvature, we think. Or let's think of what Greg was just saying, the, the phasing and the fact that you've now very comfortably put these two things on the end and they may be oriented in a certain way that just precludes site three from coming out, right? So we don't yet know. And like I said, this is, I really, to me, I thought this would be the thing that was the most boring DNA and then we would start doing the interesting layering the biologically relevant sequences into it to start looking at what real biology does. We're still figuring out these basic, basic things with this boring ground state sequence, right? But now we've become wedded to the sequence because we've got this rich data set of, 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 of structure. And so we kind of hate to deviate out of it because we have to rebuild it and none of them is high throughput. You know, I'm always so jealous of you guys with your, you know, you simulate and you, you calculate and you, you know, I, I, it's, it's just amazing. We're the opposite. We're slow and plotting and really the lowest throughput of anything in the world. Eventually we'll get there with more interesting sequences because for example, what if you have a promoter sequence or an enhancer sequence or even a replication initiation sequence? What if that one pops out immediately like a site three and then everything else relaxes. So again, it's all gonna be about twist and not about writhe. Well, that's gonna change, you know, remember those loops that we were looking at those models? That particular topologically insulated loop is gonna be a very different looking loop from this loop, that loop, the other loop, all the loops near it because they're yes. topologically insulated, right? So 
I can't wait. Um, and we've messed around because that OX2 DNA can be pretty useful. And we've done, yes. we've done a few filters to try to say, okay, only the stuff that behaves like the DNA that we know are we going to keep, and then we toss out the stuff that doesn't. Still, it doesn't behave right. And so we're kind of reaching our wit's end with the OX2 DNA. It just can't recapitulate this uh -huh. at this point. That's so good to know because I... Uh, I would well, have it been willing it captures, to give it a try. Good to know. It, it captures so many things. It just doesn't capture these uh, looping mechanical correlations um, with the base pair disruptions because they didn't. You remember, we had to unlock the base pair disruptions. They were not even allowing it, right? So, like, we had to say, no, 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 you, you can actually unpair. And once you unlock it, there's just too much. So, we just, there's still undefined. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, Greg long ago wanted to. Uh, define thermodynamically these circles, you know, all the way, and I'm like, we're still not there. Greg, it was what, 16 years ago? It's embarrassing. We still haven't gotten there. Thank you. You, you mathematicians, you can create a lot more stuff for me to do than I can possibly do, but I'll, I'll keep trying. Do it. I think you're muted. That's better, yes. So on those double sized circles, you have the at P site where you've got some intrinsic uh, bending occurring twice rather than once on the other ones. What difference does that make? Where you've well, got that's this the site too. Bending? That is the, the Craig Venom's WebSID site and it becomes locked in on either end. So what we wonder is really for going back to that maybe gene therapy use, could we better control a 600 base pair circle than we can control the smaller one, right? Because the smaller ones, the rules are still out there. But we can kind of lock in things. And rod shapes are very, very good, for example, for lung cancer and pancreas cancer. So we're like, okay, maybe we've already got it. Maybe, but we haven't put, because you've got to put the therapeutic sequence in there. What if we put a therapeutic sequence in there and now it becomes to the end? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, you know, we've got to do the experiment. But yeah. I could show you, I could show you the bonus slides if you guys want to see that we did do it a little bit and we have got some little bits of data to at least say that the RNA polymerases to make the message for the therapeutic are recognizing, even if they're locked on the ends, they're recognizing the sequence that we've put into these this sized um, DNA. So that was very exciting to know because that was an unknown. In fact, some people have said, because you know, it's hard to get funding for ideas. I don't know if you guys have that kind of problem, but I have, I mean, you can't just have an idea. You have to have the data and then get the funding. It's just, and so, you know, they said, no, you've made circles that are just not biologically relevant. And that was before they know that these you know, these seeks loops are in the hundreds now. And they're all those extra chromosomal DNAs that are everywhere, and it's particularly in cancer. Don't tell me those aren't important. And those are on the length scales of hundreds of base pairs. So, you know, that person was obviously very dumb, but it was enough to keep me from being funded. So we had to, you know, do the experiment to show that it could be recognized in a living human or cell or a mouse. So we've actually got some mouse data too. So in live mice, the mouse polymerases will get on and make the message that we put into these tiny circles. So that's pretty exciting. Why don't you show us a few of those extra slides and uh, unless people have other questions, there may be more pressing. I have one question. Hi, Lynn. This is Marielle. Oh, and hi, Javier. Marielle. How are you? <laughs> good to see you. Yes, good to see hi, you. Hi, Javier's Hello. here, and part of an eye. <laughs> <laughs> How about me, <he's> here? <laughs> um, just, great talk. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm definitely going to read your paper that just came out. That's exciting. Um, so you talked that exposed bases enable sharp bends, and that that increases writing. And that connection, I, can you elaborate more on that? Well, so it wasn't us. So I think that was a paper from Michelle Wong at Cornell. So she's using single molecule um, manipulation, you know, physical measurements. And it was a little bit surprising. And I think Nyes Decker has also done a few of these experiments. So in the paper, we, we refer to those papers. And we don't make that conclusion. We just said that can explain our observations. 
So we just see more writhing um, by the cryo ET, and that at least is one possible explanation. Because if you, I, I, maybe it's just geometry, right? Maybe if you just tighten that up, it just allows the loop to fold more easily. Because remember, the DNA wants to be a loop and it wants to be open. It's it's not happy being, you know, it wants to be B form really badly, and especially in these 300 base pair regime, it's like so small that it, it's it's fighting that all the time. So, I mean, it, it, they explain it better than I can do right now. Okay, no, that's good. Thank you so much. More slides. <laughs> <laughs> More slides, all right, so let's see. All right, so just this crazy thing. So where do we deliver the mini vector, right? So if we put it in the blood, it gets degraded by DNA one. And very interestingly, DNA one, which is our number one pathogen fighter, I didn't know any of this. I'm so glad I'm at a medical school. I go talk to these people and they know this stuff. There's also DNA in your lungs. There's DNA all over your body and they're degrading viruses constantly, which is pretty cool to think about. Um, so we said, okay, can we just let people inhale these little tiny vectors? Because we had published a paper that these, the tinier the DNA and the more supercoiled the DNA, the more that it can withstand shear forces. So you can actually put it through a nebulizer or you can put it through an inhaler and it will survive. So here's the model that, that my student wrote this and she just got permission to write her thesis. So, so I'm gonna use her little slide here. And this is her words down here too. But anyway, so the mini vector, you aerosolize the mini vector and a plasmid, you know, the big long plasmids that everyone else can make lots of, or linear DNA gets sheared. So not only is your message sheared, but you're delivering all of these bio, bioactive ends, which triggers all kinds of inflammation, things you don't wanna have happen in your lungs. So the fact that we can aerosolize and keep them intact is really important. So deliver them to the lungs. And if those little tiny circles that we've now put into the lungs can be expressed, they're making a hormone. Maybe you guys don't know, but hormones are tiny, tiny, encoded by tiny, tiny genes. They're like on the order of 23 um, amino acids. So that's very, very small. If you're trying to make dihydrofolic reductase or some other huge enzyme, it's not gonna work on a mini vector, right? So we had to use a hormone. And so the lungs, I don't know this either. I'm not a lung physiologist, but I have lots of friends who are. And the lungs have two sides. The, the, the cells in lungs are very polarized. The side that you breathe the air, and on the other side is the blood. Now that makes sense. It's taking the oxygen and putting it in the blood. This is why we're alive. Well, we said, well, why can't we transfect the lungs and then insert a sequence that makes it excreted to the blood? Okay, so we're asking, <laughs> We're asking a lot to happen here. But it happened, and that's what I'm telling you. So many vectors, we already knew just from looking at, at tagged many vectors with, with um, a fluorescent dye, with live mice, if we put them in, the, the, the dyes just stayed right in the lungs. So we already knew that the many vectors didn't go elsewhere. They stayed where we put them. All right, so um, leptin is the hormone that we encoded, it's only 146 amino acid. That's the pre-pro leptin and it gets clipped and makes smaller. And it's important for stuff, but in, it's not gonna be a therapeutic, but it's a nice model because all of the stuff to measure it in live mice is worked out. Not by me, obviously, I don't have to do that. So here's what a leptin deficient mouse looks like and here's what a leptin normal mouse looks like because they just don't know that they're full. It's a satiety hormone. So there's all kinds of things that we could, so she had grand plans and this is as far as we got and then, you know, the pandemic hit. So this is just what we have, but it's so exciting. So this mouse who had never, so she was already extremely obese and very slow moving, unhappy. Obesity is not the problem. I didn't know that, but I know that now. It's not that, oh, they're big and they can't move. It's, that is a readout of the other metabolic things that go wrong. So there are a lot of things that go wrong when you don't know that you're full, but you've never in your life made leptin. So that's why it's a great experimental system because it starts at baseline, which is zero. And so six days after we anesthetized the mouse, put it, you know, the mouse breathed 
the mini vector that was aerosolized. Six days later, she was making, it was a, a female mouse. This is one mouse, an N of one, so I can't get funding on this. Um, but here's the therapeutic level of leptin, which has already been determined. You need 0.1 nanogram per mil in your bloodstream. And we had six times that at day six. And, and then, I don't know, day 46, it had gone down a little bit. Six months or five months later, which is amazing, right? Because now, if you're trying to treat, people have to inject every day, every day, every single day, because it's turned over, because nobody is using the DNA to encode something. They're injecting the recombinant thing itself. So we think that this could be very, very powerful. And this is encoded on our 600 base pair mini circle, which is not too small to be recognized, because look, the mouse lungs are making it, putting it into the serum, and making leptin. So. Which drug method would you prefer? I think I'll take this one, thank you. You know, that flu shot, you can see my arm is swollen and red. You know, I'd rather have inhale. So here's where we're trying to go. Can we control the shapes? And you know, really, I'm just seeing, do we really understand DNA enough to control shapes? So we're starting to engineer these. Um, but it's really nice if it has clinical applications. So this is my lab currently. Um, she just defended her thesis. She just got permission to write. And I, I'm so glad because in COVID, we've all been locked down. So all of us at this point are at home working. But um, they're back now at this picture point. This is my undergrad who's done every single sequence, biologically or not, with OX2 DNA. And they, they just are not, they're not acting like our DNAs do. So we're giving up on OX2 DNA. And here's a medical student that I've, I've had in the lab. And we're all dutifully wearing our masks. And these are other colleagues I want to um, acknowledge. And we just got a new R35. I just realized I forgot to put that up. That one is gone. And I've got an R35 now. Oh, and that's more bonus slides. But that's enough. That's enough. So I thank you guys for inviting me. It's so good to see your faces. Um, I've missed you all. It's crazy this time. Well then, thank you for a terrific talk. <laughs>